I don't know, people, they see an artwork of mine and it's, it's a pettibone because it has a, the same line work or, or more likely it's the style of the lettering I do. Or it's a surf line, you know? And uh, beyond that, they're interchangeable, you know? That's not to say I'm going to uh, quit doing and taking it seriously within the, for the work itself, within the work itself. Yeah, I've, I've kind of taken a hiatus from that because it, it does make myself question what the hell I've been doing, you know, which is fine for me, you know, because I'm just burnt out on the art world. It's not that uh, I've run out of material or words or pictures. I've got enough of those in, in my head or in my notes to last several lifetimes. That was Raymond Pettibone. I'm Jamie Brissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More of a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Raymond Pettibone is an American visual artist of great acclaim. Most of his work is text and image combined, some painting, some drawing. I first encountered his work on the cover of punk rock records in my teens, in my angst-ridden teens. He did a cover for Black Flag that sat on my shelf, and he did a lot of posters and flyers. His work was synonymous with that whole period, and definitely synonymous with rebellion, and with the stuff that scares our parents at that age. And so I followed him closely. He started doing surf art in the 80s and 90s. And when I say surf art, very different to what you typically encounter. I mean, he was working from a different place with it all. He grew up in Hermosa Beach. He was around surfers. And I think he was inspired by the culture. His work is collected globally in both private and major public collections. He's won many awards, and he's a big figure in the art world. When did you first encounter surfing? Can you remember? Well, I grew up, uh, for the most part, in Hermosa Beach, so it was kind of all around me. What was it that drew you to surfing? What drew me to it? Um, you know, it was partly being drawn into it, and because uh, you know that was that was what was was around, and uh, you know, when you're an impressionable kid growing up at the beach, there wasn't as much of a. I wasn't drawn into it, probably for the better, you know, because those things are. Uh, it's like a riptide. It's not exactly. Uh, under your control, you know, at a, especially a young age, you know, you can surf parallel to the beach or whatever. But uh, what works in the junior lifeguard doesn't always work so well, in fact. And so I wasn't drawn into it as much as some kids were, where it becomes a completely all engulfing part of their lives and they're, um, they become more surfers more than people. That's a, that's a comment, you know, I, I take back, but there is some truth. No, I, 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 I'm the, I'm the living embodiment of that. I mean, there, there's that one piece that you have with Gumby riding a wave and it says lived, loved, wasted, died, PS surfed. And, and I, and I thought that could be my tombstone. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you've done a, a, a other things yeah i i guess the th i guess the, the main point we're getting at is that surfing can be so all-consuming and it can kind of take over your life and uh and I, I i you know what's interesting is i came across your your work early on mainly via record covers you know black flag records that we'd listened to when i was 13 14 years old and um and i and i have the sense that there's a sort of a parallel and i say that in the sense of just when I when I consciously was trying to break away from surfing, your artwork was was there prominently, and and your artwork had expanded into other places, and uh, and it's interesting. All these years later, you know, like four decades later, um, you and I are friends. You you have a new book out that I recently wrote an essay for, and um, and I think to some extent the art making can be consuming the same way 
chasing waves can be for surfers? Not not as much art making as uh, you you brought up punk, you know, first. That would be uh, much the same, I think. You know, there it's one thing to grow a, a mohawk, you know, that that doesn't go well with uh, most parents, you know, trying to raise their kids and uh, but that can be grown over, you know, <laughs> and I saw so many people basically throw their lives away, you know, when they didn't have the maturity to, to know any better and I could just foresee it. And, you know, the, um, it's, it's a sad state of affairs, you know, when, uh, I was watching Gidget, the film, the other day and his message of typically Hollywood will you know make these straw characters just to put them in their place that uh the big kahuna and moondoggy were actually uh uh young executives on the go you know it was just it wasn't yeah the, you know the message it was meant to be a complete lifestyle life defining act you know, to catch a few waves or even to, to build your own shack on the beach and uh, live like mm -hmm. that for a few years. Uh, the Kahuna, he was a commercial pilot, I mean, for mm -hmm. airlines, I, I believe. And Moondoggy was a uh, future executive. You, you contrast with, that, with the real people who it was based upon Mickey Dor, well, that's a sad act, you know, in itself. He lived his his life as a surfer to the, with a few interruptions and in, uh, incarcerated. But uh, you know, at what expense yeah. to other people? Is there, you know, speaking of Dora, are there any icons from the surf world that you find interesting and and find inspiring for 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 making work? I don't know. Perhaps tangentially, uh, Dennis Wilson. You know, as he. Uh, I've been doing these small stories in, on uh, Twitter for a while about the surf world, uh, Spawn Ranch, you know, which Dennis Wilson does have something to do with Venice Beach. Uh, in particular, um, 50s and 60s and 70s uh, West Coast jazz, which would include Hermosa Beach and Venice and uh, Sinanon and uh, Malibu and um, trying to think of any others I would name. I don't know. I don't think. Yeah. When you're uh, thinking about your work, the text element is, is very big. It's a very big component. And I, and I, I will say this, like as a writer, when I listen to music, my ear goes to lyrics almost before it goes to the melody. Like I'm, I'm just like looking for, great lyrics. And one of the things that draws me to your work is that uh, there's the visual element, which of course I'm always taking in, but what's what's in the text is the thing that ties it all together or makes it punch for me. And, I, and I'm curious, like thinking about like some of your surf paintings and drawings, and then there's the text element. Are you sort of writing from the perspective of an imagined surfer? Well, sometimes I suppose. I mean, I'm not... Um... I wouldn't call myself schizophrenic, but I, I can write in multiple voices, but uh, it doesn't have to be specifically a surfer. And uh, I, I probably, most of the lyrics are misheard uh, by me. So that's not always a bad thing, you know, to, it, it can be kind of what uh, the relationship between my writing and my reading is, it comes out of it. But it it's mm -hmm. not verbatim so much. Misheard song lyrics. Now, there's a great topic. I, I can think of songs from my teen years when I was a competitive surfer, and I was almost like hearing what I wanted to hear, and I would turn them into these kind of spurs that would that would push me forward. I remember in particular there was one from Iggy Pop, and, and I don't even know what the lyric, the real lyric was, but in my head I heard get me out. I can't accept a second rate life story. And it was this thing about as a, as an aspiring competitive surfer, it was sort of like, if I don't make my surf dreams come true, I'm going to have this second rate shitty life story. 
And I use I would listen to it through a Walkman and ride my bike at like ridiculously fast speeds to try to build my fitness so that I could win the surf contest. But I, I, I look back and I think, wow, how great that I listened that I misheard it. If I heard it right, it it was something else, and it was it didn't have that inspiration. Yeah, why not? Not to not to speak to you, but uh, sometimes finishing uh, first incessantly, you know, like. Kelly Slater, not to make a, I don't mean this is a bad example of him at all, but uh, your opportunities to go into other things rather than endorsements and uh, occasional general commercial or whatever are not uh, forthcoming, you know? So my, my point was uh, there's more to life than uh, being in the water, you know, but not to knock that either because the surfing experience, you know, the way it's put up by any, any surfer of any stature uh, is, is spoken of with the, you know, the same, in the same way of how in, incomparable it is. And uh, once you do it, you know, this is your, your life and nothing wrong with that. But uh, in reality, it's not always, the greatest you've made so much work around surfing um paintings and drawings and collages is it a perfect metaphor that you can kind of smear around and and and, and communicate a lot of ideas using surfing as the sort of subject matter what is it i don't know i may be too close to it to even uh look at it from a, from a certain point of view but um uh, I don't know. It's not, it's, uh, I do have some local knowledge of surfing, you know, so that helps. And, uh, you don't have to be taken off on a 50 foot wave, you know, for that either. It's like, you know, sometimes I, I put it like, uh, uh, Turner to, to paint you know, some of his uh, storms at sea and, and uh, among other things, to have himself um, lashed to the mast physically, you know, in, per in person, so he can experience the, the storm at sea, so he can then go back and paint it, you know, in his studio. That's a... Uh, that helps, yep. you know, I would think. I think it's completely necessary, but, um, you know, I do I do have a, a certain amount of knowledge of, of surfing and, and surfing culture. And yeah, it's not, they're not specifically about surfing necessarily. And uh, you don't have to be a, a surfer, you know, to, well, I guess you do to some extent to be able to get, you know, of what it, what it's about, but it doesn't, not just, no, it's not a pre yeah. prerequisite. Have you ever done like specific trips to, you know, Hawaii to watch big waves to, to fuel your, your work, or is it more just picking it up via magazines, movies, et cetera? No, I've never gone in any, um, uh, research um, trips. I was immersed in it growing up. And uh, in Hermosa, just to, just to surf with any frequency, you really have to go other places. That's another issue, you know, surf trips and because it's flat, you know, or not yeah. even worth going out. Yeah, you know, I, you. I the time that you were growing up, I imagine... Um, so Hermosa Beach was kind of an epicenter. There was that strip of all the surf shops, all the big manufacturers were there. And um, and what's interesting that I've seen in surfing is at the time you were growing up, like, yes, for sure, uh, Hermosa Beach is not a great surf break by any means. But at that time, given the equipment and the limitations of the equipment, it was a totally legit spot that people would frequent. And whereas now you'd look at it and go, okay, got to go elsewhere and find a bigger, you know, more performance oriented wave or what have you. But you mu it must have been sort of inescapable, like even if you walked down to the market, you would have passed surfers, I imagine. Yeah, of course. 
And uh, they had the surf contests there for a while at Hermosa Beach Pier every year, which they quit. They finally quit doing because there just wasn't any surf. But that didn't stop. Like the the post uh, Gidget and Beach Boy generation, you didn't really have to be a, a surfer to make the scene, you know, you uh, ho-dads, right? Yep. When did you start drawing? Um, well, I always have somewhat. Mm -hmm. I guess the late teens. Was it ever a conscious effort to be become an artist, or were you just doing what, what felt really natural? I think it's it's both and neither. Um, it's not something I I just fell into, although in a sense, uh, yeah, I fell into it, but uh, with the consciousness of knowing what I was doing and how it, uh, at least in a perfect world, how it should be received, which, uh, you know, I'm not, for that matter, I'm not there uh, as of yet and never will be. But um, it didn't, it, neither, it, neither did it happen by accident or so, you know, the existencies of fate or and coincidence, but uh, neither was it uh, a careerist move, you know, where I had it, everything mapped out and pointed to where I'm going to be someday. No, and, and you know, that's something that uh, that I really love and respect, Raymond, is having moved through the art world to, to a certain extent, I have seen... Um, so many people who have very craftily made their careers and it's as much about getting seated next to the right person at the art dinner as it is about being alone in their studio making work. But I think, I think one of the things that you've done that's so respectable and, and, and people appreciate is that you come from this sort of, to my mind, like very purest point to, side of, of just, it's about the work. And I've, I've, I've gone to your openings and you're, and you're sometimes not even there Whereas the you know the other artists would be like so happy to be there and soak up the glory and being the center of attention and I I, I don't know I, I I can say like for me personally you've been a great inspiration in this in in the sense of like just learn how to sit alone and make your work um, and that's that's what it is that's the whole thing but it's so easy to confuse that with the scene quote unquote or uh, you know climbing being a careerist that's just not in my blood that's not in my personality and that's not a model for anyone else to follow or to uh point at you know that that's uh making art in its pure state i mean it's it's making art and making art as i do it tends to crowd out a lot of else because it's time consuming and it's 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 not with an eye on the market or god knows i i wouldn't say that as a as a model to, to, well, actually I would to take that back as a model for young artists to follow because if you try to fit yourself into the market, that's, that's uh, probably a, a least likelihood of what you call success is awaiting than if you, uh, than if you don't. But, uh, that's never been an issue um, with me. And I think, uh, and I have a lot of respect. I've, I've known, you know, so many great people in the art world and galleries and um, every end of it. But uh, I think they just get in the way more than anything else. You're listening to Soundings with Jamie Brissick. This podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Now, back to our guests, Raymond Pettibone. We've talked about this before, but I'm always curious, you know, I grew up reading surf mags and originally it was sort of, I was fascinated by the, 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 the great surfers and the, and the moves they were doing. 
And then the the caption element would grab me. And I can remember captions from when I was 13, 14 years old in Surfer Magazine, Surfing Magazine. Um, and then later I, I started writing about surfing and then I became the editor at Surfing Magazine. And there was this incredibly fun thing that was picking the photos for the next mag and then basically printing them out and taking them home for the weekend and writing the captions. And, you know, I had this realization that like, one of the things that draws me to your work is there is there's a a caption element or a text element to there's a, there's a sort of putting a visual to to some kind of phrasing some some sort something in the text realm and uh, and it's much like the magazines I grew up on and what with when you're working on a piece are you how much of your head is in the text writing the the, the copy oh it it uh... It's not one and the same. They are there is differences, but it one needs other. I was I was just I because I have this old surfer magazine here, and the other day, last night I was just thumbing through it absentmindedly, and I was I was looking at the captions, you know, like. Uh, Here's Rory Russell at Pipeline. When inside, you never really get the chance to see the miracle around you. For every bit of concentration, you must be directed towards where you're going. So take this opportunity to check the subtle droplets from your place of relative security. Here's a, a, a line can only come so close. Uh, and I was I was struck by the, the captions and how they... You know exactly what year uh, the magazine is from. You know from mm -hmm, mm -hmm. options of here's this is seventy six seventy seven. There are in instances of detachment that flow by all too quickly when instincts all that bring. Well, those aren't the the best examples, but the game is to stay within the circle of death, taunting the inevitable while avoiding the horns with casual elegance. I think there was a, a a lot of marijuana smoke wafting from the offices of Surfer Magazine back in that time. Yeah, I would think so. And uh, that kind of 70s spirituality, I guess. It is a picture of its time, you know. You'd have to know somewhat about this to, to begin with. What's been, when you think about your kind of most prolific periods, which seem to be a lot of the time. What's your day like? I mean, how, how many hours are you in the studio or, or is it kind of always living in your head? Yeah, I don't, I don't make it a, you know, it's not an issue of being prolific. It's just a matter of how I am at the time. And, um, I, I tend to be working a lot, but, uh, I can turn it on and off, you know, it, mm -hmm. Especially writing, which is, like I said, you, you know, it takes both. But um, that's probably the primary reason what, what I'm in it for. And the writing? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to separate the two and make one jealous of the other. Yeah, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious about the writing because I, uh, it took me a long time to get here, but I, the, and and I and I'm I think different to you. I mean, I, I was a, I was a pretender trying to, to find my way into writing and it took a long time, but now I do at times feel sort of possessed by it. I mean, it's, it's there. It's, it's, I think, um, words are, words are floating through my head all day long and I'm happy because I, I, I wanted to get to this place, but it didn't, it wasn't mm -hmm. like I was just born with that. I was a surfer first and then I came to writing late, but I see when I read your work, it inspires me and I have that sense of words tumbling out of you. I'm not at, not at a loss for words. I mean, uh, most people know we would say the opposite, but that's that's in a social setting, a quasi social setting. You know, it's not it's not my work situation. When I do write, it's not like one of these recomm recommendations or my personal setting of waking up at a certain time and almost like a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a writer's table uh, and I don't have to make uh, 
demarcations of put aside time to do it. On the other hand, it doesn't have to encroach upon the other parts of your life such as they are. I mentioned the right to UCLA. Well, that was, I think since then I do most or my best writing in transit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because then you don't, you're not bothered by anything else. No, and I, f I find that so interesting. I remember reading uh, Bob Dylan Chronicles Volume 1, and he talks about that. Ha a lot of writing happens in transit. And there there is something about um, – I mean, I actually started writing on planes. I was, I was chasing surf contests around the world, and I'd be stuck on an airplane. It was kind of my version of what you describe on the bus two and a half hours to and from Hermosa Beach to Westwood. Um, I'd have like a 12-hour flight to you know Johannesburg from Heathrow or via New York. And I was very social and used to being kind of, you know, surrounded by the like frat, frat boy thing of surfers. And I'd be stuck by myself and it was sort of this inner life opened up and, and, and a lot of it poured out. But, um, do you, um, have you ever had like, have you ever had blocks of your period where periods where it's sort of not coming out and you, you're, you're, you're wondering if it went away? I can't think of any really probably the, the closest to that would be, um, I dread having uh, commissions or like the Black Flag album covers. Those were those were almost always they pre-existed. You know, they they just mm -hmm. grew drawings I already have, which is fine. That's that doesn't. But if you ask me to to do, uh, you know, these fuckers coming by with these brilliant ideas, yeah, uh, you know. No, I don't work well that way, and uh, that's the only thing uh, that will uh, make me just stop and dread. Do you have self doubts about your work? Are you? Do you ever have times when you're really, uh, you know, afraid of it not being what you'd hoped? I wouldn't say. Uh, I wouldn't say self doubts. Um, it's not an issue one way or another, you know, whether, whether it's self-doubt or overconfidence. I don't think that really plays into what I do. Uh, nor is it, uh, let's say, striving, you know, to for towards perfection or or even to get better. Um, those aren't issues uh, I think of consciously or either. Uh, unconsciously either maybe maybe they're internalized somewhat i do have a lot of respect for the game though you know which is the work itself uh what what goes into the work all the people who preceded me then influences and and also my audience you know which whatever that may be mm -hmm. But what I was what I was going to say is I, it's just it's I'm I've been in the game for a long time, you know, and my whole life basically. And to realize, you know, it, it comes as some uh, I wouldn't call it a quite an epiphany, but as long as I've been and I've made zero inroads, and uh, you know, I I could be throwing any garbage into the art world and it'd be like, oh yeah, great, fantastic. I don't know, people, they see an artwork of mine and it's it's a pedibone because it's, uh, it has a, the same line work or or more likely it's the, it's a style of the lettering I do or it's a surf line, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond that, they're interchangeable, you know? That's not to say I'm going to uh, quit doing and taking it seriously within the for the work itself, within the work itself. Yeah, I've, I've kind of taken a hiatus from that because it it does make you, it does make myself question what the hell I've been doing, you know. It shouldn't matter, and it really doesn't. But uh, it's mattered just enough for me to stop and throw my hands up and okay, I'll take a break here, and I'll devote my my energy to 
to making uh, small Twitter sized uh, stories, you know, mm -hmm. which which can't be monetized in any way, although they've been published. I mean, God, who the fuck would know? Which is fine for me, you know, because I'm just burnt out on the art world. It's not. It's not that uh, I've run out of material, or words, or pictures. I've got enough of those in in my head or in my notes to last several lifetimes. If you're making less work now, how how are you spending your days? Spending my days. Um, it's not a huge difference, really. I don't. Uh, my the things I write on. Uh, on Twitter, there never been much on rewriting anyway, but none of them are uh, from paper first. They're just completely off the cuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing that we live at a time where you can wake up with something in your head blasted on social media and and sort of have like immediate response. And and I don't I don't know if you hang out for that stuff. I I actually do, and I I kind of like enjoy my um, it's it's. It's a it's a part of myself that I'm maybe not proud of, and it's kind of like saturated and, and disgusting. But I enjoy like the likes and the comments and and the and the, uh, throwing out something that might be a little off kilter and just seeing responses to it. it. It's sort of like the part of me that in seventh or eighth grade would like purposely say things to shock the pretty girls around me that made me un feel uncomfortable. I still get to do that now, and social media has created a platform for that. Yeah, I can see that. I don't know if that's. I have pretty much the the same followers, and there's that's a handful or a, a few handfuls, but they're the same ones I had when I started, which is fine, you know. I'm not I'm not looking to crash the internet or anything, <laughs> but uh, that's enough for me to respect the game and to hold up my standards of writing. Of all your works, uh, is there anything you're most proud of in terms of body of work or particular show or one of your books? My favorite works tend to be personal that you couldn't uh, explain away or explain to someone. But that God knows if I took, you know, an individual drawing, I could explain a lot about it. Okay, that's not my calling. But, uh, you know, there's just some that resonate more than others. Mm -hmm. um, they've all left my hands because I don't keep anything as some uh, personal high note or accomplishment for myself unless it's uh, a drawing I did of my son, Bo, or, you know, then it, that's uh, taken personal to that level. Mm hmm that's it's interesting uh what, what you're saying it makes me think you know you don't strike me as someone that shows up to your openings looking you know very happily standing in the as the focus of attention for the room and and soaking up the accolades which a lot of people do and that um i i i kind of feel like when i the the the, the time that i came to surfing that was sort of like baked into the surfing ethos uh of the guys i looked up to there was a sort of um don't hang out for the praise. Like the, that, I remember Peter Sheldahl in one of his books that he says this great thing about his. He's talking about having people come up to him and 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 compliment him for his writing. And he said that his wife has this thing about like if someone does that, you just walk away as quickly as you say thank you very much and walk away as quickly as possible. And when I read that, I remember thinking that's kind of the world that I came from as a surfer. Like you don't. It's not a false humility, but it's sort of like don't don't. There's a danger in letting that kind of thing blanket over you of like, oh, you're doing great work. You're great. You're great. We love your work. Like that's not where you want to live. And you strike me as someone that that understands that or or, or lives that way. I don't I don't mind uh, public uh, art openings, and I, I I well I don't look forward to them either. And I think most artists would say the same thing. They're not chore. Well, okay, if, if they're chores, fine. But they're not, you know. In real life, people have real chores and real problems, you know. So to to even put it in those terms drastically is 
is unfair uh, to me and the rest of the world. But uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know what it, some casual encounter in a crowded gallery at an opening is going to is going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Raymond. You, I, I, I've learned so much from you. I, I really mean that. Well, that's reciprocal. We should do some tandem surfing out here in the East River. We can. I, I think uh, Kelly Slater is collaborating with Elon Musk to build a wave pool out there, and there's going to be a, a stationary wave that's going to be moving through. <laughs> well, that seems likely. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is written and performed by Paz Lenchanton and Gita Valtistodor. It is produced by Paz Lenchanton and engineered by Samur Kuja. Soundings is brought to you by the Surface Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surface Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfacejournal.com and subscribe. Thank you again for listening to Soundings. We'll see you next time.